PewDiePie's Literature Club. Doki Toki, welcome back everybody to PewDiePie's Book Club. That's right, who doesn't want to know about what I think about books? <laughs> Please keep watching. Did you do your homework this month? That's right, we have homework on the PewDiePie channel now. Isn't that exciting? That's just what everyone wants more of. Please keep watching. Please keep watching. I've been reading a lot of great comments from last month saying that uh, you got into reading because of the videos that we've been doing. And that's essentially the goal of these videos is to get you part of, part of this uh, book club that we're doing. Now, last month, the books that we read was uh, The Old Man in the Sea, Moby Dick, Man's Search for Meaning and Tony Takitani. I couldn't find Tony Takitani for some reason. It's 600 pounds on Amazon. I'm so sorry if you spent that amount of money. This month, I made sure that all the books that I picked are actually accessible. My apologies, okay? I didn't do my homework, all of it, but I bet you didn't either. And if you did, I'm so sorry. I also read uh, Flowers for Algernon, recommended by Brad. Really good. The Sound of Waves. The Temple of the Golden Pavilion, Bushido, The Soul of Japan, The Book of Five Rings, Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, and I think that was it. They're very short books that I read this month. And I think I made a mistake of reading too many short books, because uh, next month I'm gonna want to read some longer novels instead of just novellas. It just sort of happened. I just pick a book I want to read and then I don't really look too much of how long it is. Anyway, let's get into this. The Old Man and the Sea by Ernst Hemingway. You know about this book. Everyone knows about this book. This is the quintessential teacher wants you to read in, in, in school kind of book, which is actually why I picked it as well, because uh, I, want, I want you to be part of this. Did you read it? What did you think? The story is of Santiago, this uh, sailor. He's very old and he's he's been unlucky for a very long time. He hasn't caught any fish. He has his young apprentice, the boy as he calls him, and uh, he's not even allowed to sail with Santiago anymore because of his parents doesn't want him to. He wants him to sail with someone that actually catches some damn fish. It takes place of of the coast of Mexico, I think, or Cuba. Santiago sets out to break this unlucky spree that he's on and he finally catches uh, something on his hook. He doesn't know what it is or how big it is, but uh, he knows it's big and it pulls him away from shore and uh, he decides very early that he's going to commit to try and catch this fish no matter what. It's a very short book, it's very simple to read, you have the pinnacle of a minimalistic approach to writing. One character essentially in such a simple setting as the ocean. I think Ernst even called it himself, he coined it iceberg theory, where you can probably guess what that means. I, I'm guessing as well that he's giving us the tip of the iceberg and it's up to us to interpret the rest. What does the fish mean? Why does he dream of lions? I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun to read and, and what kept me through it was just, is he going to catch the damn fish, fish or not? I don't know if I really think there's that much to analyze personally, but I'm sure there is. I I just, I not that interested to be honest. I, don't, I didn't find it that interesting, especially after reading Moby Dick as well well, uh, which we'll get into later. There is this theme about masculinity, I think, but that you have to catch this fish no matter what. That's, there's a certain manliness attached to that. I talked uh, about this book briefly with my mom and she said that she actually really, really didn't like it. And I wonder if it is because of the whole masculinity involved with it. I enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was alright. But the more I think about it, the less I enjoy it, to be honest. This whole iceberg theory thing just kind of annoys me. The more I think about it. Is there even an iceberg underneath the tip Hemingway? Huh? Moving on to Moby Dick. Moby Dick is a story we all know about Moby Dick. What I actually didn't know is that Moby Dick is, was a real whale that actually existed in the 1800s. It was called Maka Dick. <laughs> and Herman Neville, who wrote the, uh, the story, was a whalesman as well, or seaman. <laughs> And a book like, like Moby Dick just wouldn't exist unless that was the case. This, Moby Dick is the heart of a whalesman in, in itself. It really covers every single aspect of, uh, of whaling. And by every single aspect of whaling, I mean every single aspect. But we'll get into that. First of all, you, know, you probably know the story anyway. It follows the narrative of uh, Ismail who is this uh, good-natured Christian who wants to join a whaling voyage. So he travels and he stumbles upon uh, the other character, which is Queequeg, which is a harponier who has face tattoos. He's a cannibal. Complete opposite of uh, Ismail, but they become best- they become close friends anyway, 
and they have to share a bed together in the early chapters. And I remember reading it thinking, wow, this is so silly and it's so funny and so easy to follow. I, I read a lot of comments saying, oh, dude, are you actually going to read Moby Dick? That's uh, pretty tough stuff. And of course, I'm naive as always thinking, wow, this is so easy to follow. What are people talking about? They must not be as smart as I am. <laughs> Little did I know, the, the chapters varied a lot. The book changes style of writing, you could say a lot. It goes from narrative to straight up facts about whales, for example, to poetry, to philosophy. And uh, it's surprisingly lack of narrative in this book. You think the story of Moby Dick is so famous with uh, Captain Ahab, the, the, the captain that wants to capture this white whale no matter what to the bitter end because he seeks revenge upon Moby Dick for taking away his leg. Literally inside Moby Dick there is the book of whales inside it, which is very different from this minimalist book. You have a, a, a book with books inside it. And if you are not interested in whales, I definitely don't recommend reading this book. It basically covers every single aspect of whaling. Let me tell you about the economy and the ecology and the anatomy and the philosophy and the poetry and the, the weight and the scale and the whales of whales and the whales of everything there is about whales is basically covered in this book. And if you're not ready for that, then uh, yeah, I don't know. But there are parts that really truly shine. I almost want to just read a passage from it, but it's, I don't think we're on that level of cringe yet. But I'll tell you what, when I finished reading the book and I was uh, flipping through the pages, the first line, which is a very famous line, call me Ismail. Maybe you don't understand why it's, it's a, it's hard to explain why that carries such an emotional response reading that line, but uh, it, it really does. And for anyone that's read the novel knows what I'm talking about. It's obviously a book filled with symbolism, the, the whole expression with a white whale is a, is a saying of itself. Herman really tries to deliver something real. He does, doesn't just give us the tip of the iceberg, he gives us the whole thing. And uh, there's something honorable and that you can really appreciate about that. And I think Moby Dick, I probably, to be honest, I'm probably not really ready for it yet, but I'm really glad I read it. Look forward to read it again at some point in the future. The third book that we read, I am so glad that I picked. I think this book is incredibly important. I didn't know, I just picked it randomly because I wanted to read something about philosophy. It's Man's Search for Meaning by uh, Dr. Viktor Frankl. What's so special about this book is that Frankl is an uh, Auschwitz concentration camp survivor and he's a psychiatrist. So he can then answer the question, what went through the minds of people that survived these concentration camps? And I really want to discuss this book with people and whenever I did, I just, I was just met with boredom uh, because no one wants to hear about the Holocaust. People are tired of hearing about the Holocaust. We know it's bad, okay? How often are we gonna get a piece of literature that really puts to test? Almost, you can say. It's almost like Victor treats himself as a lab rat. That's a not appropriate expression, but I think you, it's the best way to explain it. He discusses a lot, uh, for example, the quote from Nietzsche. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. And Victor really puts this to the test because, uh, put it this way, uh, the whole phrase, what's the meaning of life, is, is asked to death. But Victor Frankl actually does a really great job at trying to answer that question. And uh, I, I couldn't help but agree with a lot of it. I also thought that uh, it was really great how this book was originally written in uh, without an author's name in, my, in mind. It was published anonymously originally. I feel like this book is, is a great tool to just help people. And especially, maybe I'm overgeneralizing here, but I, I feel like a lot of millennials are struggling to find meaning. I certainly feel better equipped for in case, I know that sounds a bit weird to say, but in case something really bad happens, I feel like I, from reading this book, I am better equipped to know how to handle it. That's a bit naive to say, but uh, I, th I really think there's some important stuff in here and it's hard for me to explain <laughs> clearly. <laughs> the next book is much easier to talk about. It's recommended by Brad. Flowers by Algernon. Thank you, Brad. Great recommendation. Really enjoy this one. Uh, after reading Moby Dick, I, I wanted something easier to follow. It follows the story of Charlie Gordon, who has an IQ of 68. He lives a happy life uh, and he works at a bakery 
and he enjoys his time around his friends but he knows he's not very smart he knows he's stupid he wants to become smarter more than anything and we basically follow his progress reports through the book that he writes he's instructed to write because he's ongoing this experiment that will actually make him uh, successively more and more intelligent and, and we follow him realizing that things that used to be positive such as people that he thought were his friends were actually just making fun of him and uh, he has to quickly find himself growing up in a very short period of time uh, you can't help but sympathize for Charlie it's a very tragic sad story it was uh, it was really fun to read from start to finish however and I really really enjoyed it and it was a great recommendation thank you Brad Appreciate it. The Metamorphosis with Franz Kafka is one I read. It's so quick. I almost uh, kind of feel like I should just discuss it next um, month. But I'm going to talk about it anyway. To me, the idea of turning into in an insect is just the most disgusting idea ever, and it just freaks me out. I remember in the movie District 9, the main character sort of becomes this alien, weird, insect-like thing, and... It freaks me out! Funnily enough though, Franz Kafka explicitly didn't want the cockroach to be on the cover because once you read the book, uh, the novella, you really understand it's not about the cockroach. Uh, the story is about Gregor who one day wakes up and finds himself that he's turned into a giant cockroach. Uh, and the first thing that goes through his mind is, funnily enough, how am I going to get to work? <laughs> Gregor has been supporting his family by uh, financially by working and he doesn't really enjoy his job he knows he wants to quit it but he he's not able to do it quite yet but now he finds himself that he's a cockroach and we follow how the family tries to deal with that they try and lock him in they want to help Gregor but they don't really know how and they sort of keep uh, keep him a secret for other people. They don't want other people to find out uh, about this, obviously. It's really just a story about isolation and feeling not wanted and feeling like you're a problem. It's such an awful feeling. Anyone that's felt like that can, can sympathize with Gregor and uh, feeling like an actual cockroach. And that's at least why I think he chose a cockroach while writing this. It's a very sad story far following and I can't help but sympathize with Gregor. And reading about Franz Kafka's life as well afterwards, I sort of understand more and more that this is a very personal story. Uh, he had issues with his father. Franz Kafka burnt 90% of his work as well. He didn't even want anyone to read it, which I also can then understand because it's clearly very personally drawn. And whenever I do stuff that's very personal on YouTube, I, I want to delete it afterwards because I, I don't want other people to share. I don't know if that's the case or why he did it, but um, I can at least relate to it in that sense. Uh, yeah, it's a sad story. I don't want you to tell me. I'm getting emotional just talking about it. <laughs> it's a kind of no novel that's... Uh, it's open for interpretation. A lot of people discuss, is the father the, the bad figure, or is it the sister who's the bad one, and da 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 da. Um, yeah, whatever you think. I don't know. Read it. It's good. Discovering this author has been one of the most fun discoveries I had in a very long time. I am so intrigued by this author, Yukio Mishima. I wanted to read more Japanese literature, because I really like Murakami, so I... Uh, randomly pick Yukio Mishima's uh, The Sailor Who Fell From Grace From The Sea and I was so in... what's the right word? Entranced by it? I felt so lost reading this book in, in the best possible way and uh, I absolutely loved it. It follows the story of a young boy who's uh, sort of have an adolescent mind. Nubaro is a very young boy but he has, an, like I said, an adolescent mind. He lives in a seaside town of Yokohama which is, I think, south of Tokyo. It doesn't matter, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> He's secretly part of this strange gang. It's sort of like a thought gang is the best way to describe it. They they completely reject conventional ideas and more. they have their own set of morals. It was just so interesting, it was like anything I've ever read. And uh, I, I really, really enjoyed that because of how different it was and how strange he was. It's not like I agreed with everything, but I just was intrigued hearing about it. Nubaro uh, meets with this sailor uh, called Ryuji and he sees Ryuji in an extreme high regard. He's he as a pristine figure uh, because he's the pinnacle of manliness essentially. He's a man that committed his whole life to the sea, he's deliberately chose not to settle down with a wife and he goes on all these adventures and uh, Nubaro just looks up to this sailor. But then Ryuji meets with Nubaro's mom who is a widow and works in a shop and 
they connect and eventually they want to settle down with each other. So Ryuji wants to settle down and become a husband essentially, even though it was against his principles. And Nobaro, obviously he has a problem with this because in, not just because it's his mom that's involved, but because in his thought gang, they look at fatherhood as one of the worst things possible is to be a father. And he wants to protect this pristine image that he has of Ryuji. Nobaro and his thought gang decides I don't know why I keep calling it Thought Gang, it's just a gang, but um, they decide what they're gonna do about it, and uh, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> it was really fun reading a story that was so interesting, and then obviously the symbolism with all the characters. Two cultures meeting, you have Ryuji, who's the, the pinnacle of manliness, he represents honor, and uh, I think old old Japan, the wife that's that represents the post-war culture, and then you have Nobara that wants to gatekeep and protect the culture, because uh, there was a giant cultural shift uh, after the World War II, and that's a big theme for Yuki Mishima's work, which I learned afterwards. Right after reading the, the Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea, I loved it so much and I wanted more because it was so short. I read The Temple of the Golden Pavilion, and I absolutely Love day. I feel like I want to do a video just exclusively at some point about Yuki Mishima once I, I read more of his work because I'm so fascinated by him. His whole life is a story in of itself and that sort of strangely merged with all his uh, novels. It's just so interesting. I don't uh, If you're interested in reading the book, just read the book first, I would say, because for me the discovery of, the, of this author was just... Uh, so much fun and I don't want to take that away from anyone. I also read Sound of Waves. I don't really have too much to say about it, but I think I should move on from uh, Mishima for now and then maybe we'll discuss it more in the future. After I read The Book of Five Rings, I feel like such a kid uh, when it comes to this book. I just can't help myself. This is like the coolest book ever. <laughs> I know, I know, it's the kind of book that people take very seriously, and they want to, uh, they want to really analyze and give a lot of thought to to um, the words. Um, but I just, I, I feel like such a child with this book. Anyway, it's about Japan's greatest warrior. He's an undefeated warrior who's passing along his knowledge that of what he's learned. His uh, master of strategy, I think he calls it, or something like that. It's a real work. It's not a. It's not fiction, or who knows? I mean, it was written literally hundreds of years ago. So I don't know if any of it has been confirmed or not. But it's still. How cool is that? You have an undefeated warrior who's just explaining how he became undefeated. How cool is that? The book contains the Book of Fire, the Book of Water, Wind, Earth, and Void. It discusses the, how his strategy is scalable, and if you master his strategy, if you can defeat one foe, you can defeat any number of foes, and essentially become invincible. The pinnacle of zero deaths, everyone. He has this sort of nonsense approach to fighting, where no flare involved, you should really just focus on cutting down your enemy, that's the number one thing. He talks about the fact that he, instead of holding the katana, traditionally people hold it with two hands. He ha holds it with one hand, which is harder, but if you can master it, it's very beneficial. But, and then he holds in this other hand the wakizaki. How fucking cool is that? How cool is that? <laughs> I've been enjoying just uh, keeping this in my pocket and reading a passage every once in a while and just thinking about it. I'd be lying if I said I understand anything that is in this book. To apply stickiness. When the enemy attacks and you also attack with the longsword, you should go in with a sticky feeling and fix your longsword against the enemies as you receive his cut. The spirit of stickiness is not hitting very strongly, but hitting so that the longsword do not separate easily. It is best to approach as calmly as possible when hitting the enemy's longsword with stickiness. The difference between stickiness and entanglement is that stickiness is firm and entanglement is weak. You must appreciate this. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot to learn from this book and people still um, use the teaching for other fields of profession today. Obviously, you don't have to be a samurai in today's society, but people use it in business, for example, and using his strategy in business. I just love how, how 
this book exists. I think it's fantastic. Last but not least, I read, uh, I was so fascinated by the whole uh, samurai and I wanted to learn more about the samurai, so I read Bushido, The Soul of Japan. For anyone that wants to learn more about Japanese culture and, and the history of it, I think Bushido is a great starting point. It's, it, it's The book is called Bushido, The Soul of Japan for a reason because the code of ethic of the samurai has left such a huge impact Japanese society and culture even still today. The explaining why politeness is so important in, in Japanese culture and the logic behind the politeness as well was really interesting to know about. I think this is a great book if you want to learn about self-control, control their self-impulses. But the chapters that I enjoyed the most was the, grimly enough about seppuku. I'm sure you've heard about seppuku before but in case you don't know it's the act of committing suicide or execution. It's sort of a mix in between but the, the samurai valued honor more than anything. Honor was more valuable than life itself and if a samurai messed up in a, in a way, made a bad choice or th the punishment would be seppuku but it will also be a way for them to restore their honor. Going down on, on your knees and cutting your guts open with a short sword and there's a specific reason why the guts is chose for it and um, and then someone would cut off your head uh, right afterwards. The, the reason why they did do this was to restore honor and they honor meant more to them than anything and their approach, the samurai approach to death I find so interesting uh, instead of trying to fight it they see it as an opportunity. I don't know, I thought it was very fascinating to learn about and I really, really enjoyed it. And I definitely recommend this book if you're interested in Japanese culture. That's right. I love Japan. What are, what are you gonna do? Sue me? That was it! Thank you for watching. <laughs> we did it. I'm loving this series. I'm having so much fun reading. I know it sounds so pretentious in a way almost, but now, for the books that we're gonna read next month, I really want to read Crime and Punishment. Uh, a lot of people recommended it from last month, so I thought, okay, yeah, why not? I also want to read Stoner, I also want to read No Longer Human, and I think we should just start with those three. I don't want to overwhelm you guys as well. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate all the support and all the fantastic comments that I get on these videos. Um, it really means a lot, and I'll see you next month.